I'm uh, Lynn Staley, Professor Emeritus in Orthopedics from the University of Washington as well as Seattle Children's Hospital. And today I'm going to talk about the shelf acetabuloplasty and its current indications. The shelf history is interesting in that it was described over a hundred years ago and was the first acetabular procedure. Over the next decades, scores of different shelf designs were reported. There were problems, however, with the shelf and that tended to, to dissolve. It was non-load-bearing. Often the shelf was placed too high, not load-bearing, and over a period of time, it would progressively get smaller and dissolve away completely. So this problem, together with the report of numerous pelvic osteotomies, led to a decline in interest in the shelf procedure. The pelvic osteotomies can be classified in a number of ways, but the most common is to classify them as reconstructive, that is moving hyaline cartilage into load-bearing surface, and those that are so-called salvage procedures in which there is a fibrocartilage uh, articular surface. Uh, this is based on the premise, yet unproven, but generally accepted, that hyaline cartilage is superior to fibrocartilage in terms of longevity. However, even the hyaline cartilage uh, procedures are not permanent necessarily. For example, this study done in 2002 of a solder osteotomy with hyaline cartilage moving with a 30-year follow-up, which is sort of a mid-adult life, there were 20% failure rates uh, with a score of less than 70. So uh, these not necessarily are permanent. The also a question was whether or not the fibrocartilage underwent metaplasia into, into hyaline cartilage with time. And this was studied by Diabinol and reported in the British Medical Journal, uh, Bone and Joint Journal in 2005 with a 30-year follow-up on uh, shelf procedures. And they found that the fibrocartilage of the shelf uh, was durable, but did not undergo metaplasia from fibrocartilage to hyaline cartilage as one thought was possible. Now this presentation is based on, first, my interest in the shelf procedure and overcoming some of the problems of previous shelf operations, which was published in 1981. And then also we published a series in 1984 of its use in cerebral palsy. And then again in 1992 in a large series in augmentation for dysplasia in, in childhood and adolescence. The procedure was also described in the excellent text uh, atlas uh, by Morrissey and Weinstein in which they described the slotted acetabular augmentation. Well, what is this procedure in a very brief way? Well, first of all, one makes a bikini incision that's cosmetic. The second is to review the anatomy of the left hip, for example, with reflected head uh, at the articular surface. The first step is to detach the reflected head anteriorly and displace it posteriorly. The next step is to create a slot just at the acetabular margin, using that as a guide. Make drill holes and connect with a rongeur. The next step is to harvest graft from above and place strips of the graft in the slot out over the joint capsule to create a CE angle of about 35 or 40 degrees. The next step is to place the reflected head uh, back to hold the graft in place. And some people skip this step, but there's no harm in having this reflected head incorporated in the graft and the mass of the graft. And the next step is to add additional graft above to make the augmentation thick and durable and also to prepare should a total hip replacement be necessary later on. And finally, to place the spike of cast, which we'll talk about later. Now, how have more recent reports of the slotted acetabular augmentation uh, 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 report? And this, these are the summary generally that it's relatively simple, safe, and effective operation. In Australia in 2000, they report 18 cases and they used no casts. So that seemed to work for them. In China, they had 15 cases in children. And in Slovenia, in 15 cases in teens and young adults as was the case in Formosa of teens and young adults. And then there were multiple papers 
showing the value of the shelf in parentheses, which we'll talk about in a subsequent video. Now, there are a number of new variations. One is uh, that one can do this through a minimal, minimum exposure. It's a very small operation, can be a small incision, and this uh, reduces the uh, disability and the discomfort. Uh, that maybe no cast in stable hips is just fine. And if a cast is, is necessary, uh, to be put on to put in flexion, ab, a little abduction, internal rotation to reduce a, a hip that's wide, that it can be walking. Leave the foot out, bend the knee so it doesn't slide down. And this can be very effective and be uh, after the patient is comfortable. And then there are a variety of different shelf techniques which can be employed. So what are the current indications for the shelf operation, in my estimation at least? I think that for very severe hips, where there's really no other alternative, that the shelf, because of its versatility, can be employed. The second indication would be for those who want a very safe, simple, inexpensive, and yet effective procedure uh, that uh, uh, doesn't uh, incur very much risk and and uh, the families may wish this and, and uh, as a temporary uh, measure or for a few decades until the patient's old enough for a total hip replacement. And finally, it's pro the, probably the greatest indication is for Perthes disease in the older child that is above the age of eight. And it may be the best treatment option we'll talk about in the companion video. So I thank you for watching this video and please send me any comments to Staley at UW dot edu